Okay, so today we're going to run through the Physics Paper 4 Theory paper, the extended paper, and this is from May, June 2017. The paper code 0625-41, and this is a Cambridge CIE examination. Let's begin. We'll get her done. No one says that. Question 1. Figure 1.1 is the speed-time graph for an ice skater. Um, so we get speed in meters per second on the left, on the y-axis, and time in seconds on the x-axis. We can see it's getting slower as it travels along. So, first question. Explain what is meant by deceleration. That's a, quite an interesting question, actually. Deceleration means an object is slowing down. It doesn't mean it's got a negative acceleration, because it might be going in a negative direction. That would mean it's getting faster. Deceleration always means it's slowing down. Now B, use figure 1.1 to determine uh, 1. The distance travelled between times t equals 3 seconds and time t equals 6 seconds. OK, how many marks is this? Two marks. All right, so we don't have to do a huge amount here, but let's just put down some key points. Got a speed time graph here. And the distance travelled is given by the area under the graph. We're looking for the area between 3 seconds and 6 seconds. And that is given by these two areas here, area A and area B. So the top point here is 11 metres per second. The point, the base of the triangle is 5 metres per second. And of course, the base of the rectangle there is 0. The length between here and here, this is 3 through to 6. So this side is 3 seconds wide. And this is 5 metres per second high. For the triangle, this is 3 metres wide. Oh, sorry, 3 seconds wide. And it's 6 metres per second high. So the area under the graph is just area A plus area B. And that's for a triangle half base times height. we just labeled those and that's one half times three times six plus three times five which is then just nine plus fifteen which is twenty four meters key point it's asking about distance there's no units make sure you put the unit in so the answer is twenty four meters Part 2. The deceleration between times t equals 3 seconds and t equals 6 seconds. So acceleration is given by change in speed over change in time. Well, technically change in velocity divided by change in time. But we're doing with the speed time graph here. It's final speed minus initial speed over final time minus initial time. Oh, there we go. And that gives us a value of negative 2 meters per second squared. But it's not asking for the acceleration, it's asking for the deceleration. So that negative 2 meters per second becomes, oh sorry, negative 2 meters per second squared becomes 2 meters per second squared. There we go, that's the rate it's slowing down at. C1, state what happens to the size of the deceleration after time t equals 6 seconds. So let's look at that. All right, what we can see is it's slowing down rapidly down this section here. After six seconds, that deceleration starts to get smaller. It's all the gradient, the gradient's getting less and less. So what happens to the deceleration after time t equals six seconds? It gets smaller, it reduces. State what happens to the resultant force on a skater after time t equals six seconds. Well, F 
equals m a. Force is mass times acceleration. If the value of the acceleration is getting smaller, reducing, then the value of the force is also reducing. The mass would remain constant. So it reduces. Question 2. A footballer kicks a ball vertically upwards. Initially, the ball is stationary. Part A. His boot is in contact with the ball for 0 0.05 seconds. The average resultant force on the ball during this time is 180 newtons. The ball leaves his foot at 20 meters per second. Calculate the impulse of the force acting on the ball. Okay, well, impulse equals average force times time. That's just 180 newtons multiplied by 0 0.05 seconds, which gives us a nice number of 9 newton seconds. There we are. 9 newton seconds. Remember the units. And if you're not sure what the units should be, just leave the units in that are in the calculations. In this case, it's newton seconds. It just happens to be newtons times seconds. If you happen to deal with, say, F equals MA uh, for force, the end result would be in newtons. But you could also leave it as kilograms, meters, seconds, negative two. Just a useful little hint for you there. As we say in this case, however, it's newton seconds are the actual units we're after. The mass of the ball. All right, F equals m a. That's mass times change in velocity divided by change in time. So let's put in our values for velocity and time. We've got the mass multiplied by uh, 20 meters per second minus 0 meters per second it starts off at stationary divided by the time we're told it takes 0 0.05 seconds there we are so that's 20 I'll leave the units out of the calculation just make it a bit easier divided by 0 0.05 and that's the force we'll actually give a value for the force in the questions 180 newtons so if I take that, rearrange it, I get 180 newtons multiplied by 0 0.05 divided by 20 will give me a value for the mass. And of course, that's actually going to work out to be 0 0.45 kilograms. Again, remember the units. Obviously, in your test, don't draw a big arrow pointing at the units. That'd be silly. This is just because I'm talking through it. Part three, the height to which the ball rises. Ignore air resistance. Okay, this is a classic question. We start off with kinetic energy, and it's going upwards. It changes into gravitational potential energy. So we start off with one half mv squared, and that changes into gravitational potential energy, which is mass times gravity times height. Assuming that it uh, converts perfectly. There's no air resistance, so we can assume that. Half mv squared equals mgh. I'm going to just cancel through with the m's. I want to find out the height. So let's just write this out again. One half v squared equals gh, which means that h, if I divide both sides by gravity, g equals v squared over 2g. Now I can put in the information I have. That's 20 meters per second squared divided by 2 times gravity. And remember gravity, shown in the very front of the paper, is 10 meters per second squared. And just to be clear, I'll just show you where that is. Right, if I come to the front page, here we go. Acceleration of free fall, 10 meters per second squared. There we are. That's the value they want you to use. If you're going to use 9.81 because you know it's more accurate, you'll lose marks. Why? Because they've told you to use 10. They've stuck it in the very front of the, pa the paper. They can't do anything more than that. Okay, there we go. So we work that out. That's 400 meters squared seconds negative 2 divided by, uh, oh, divided by 20 uh, meters seconds negative 2. That's going to give us a value of 20 meters. And there we go. That's a value for the height that it rises up to. B. While the boot is in contact with the ball, the ball is no longer spherical. State the word used to describe the energy stored in the ball. OK. When this situation, when the energy is stored due to the change in shape, it's stored 
as elastic potential energy. Or elastic energy. Question 3, figure 3.1 shows remote sensing equipment on the surface of a distant planet. A. The mass of the equipment is 350 kilograms. The acceleration of free fall on the planet, or the surface of this planet, is 7.5 meters per second squared. So it's different to the one because we're on a new planet, different to the 10 meters per second squared. But state what is meant by the term weight. All right. So what, what is weight? Weight weight's that force exists when you're in a gravitational field. So the weight of an object It's a force due to gravity acting on an object. So weight Weight is a force due to gravity acting on an object. Part two, calculate the weight of the equipment on a planet. All right, nice easy question this, why? Because our equation for weight, weight equals mass times gravity. Well, we know what the mass is, 350 kilograms. We know the value of gravity, 7.5 meters per second squared on that planet, which gives us a value of 2625 newtons. All right, so something to look at here. I've got two significant figures here. I've got two significant figures. Whenever we deal with significant figures, we should use the same number of significant figures in the answer as the smallest number of significant figures in the question, or sometimes one more. So I've got two significant figures uh, for the 350 kilograms, two significant figures for the 7.5 meters per second squared. So I should have two significant figures in the answer. I start off here with 2625 newtons, and I should change that to be 2600 newtons. There we are, two significant figures. B, the equipment releases a balloon from a point that is a small distance above the surface of the planet. The atmosphere at the surface of the planet has a density of 0.35 kilograms per meter cubed. The inflated balloon has a mass of 80 grams and a volume of 0.3 meter cubed. Make an approximate calculation and then predict and explain the direction of any motion of the balloon. Show you're working out. Okay, so what we need to use here is that Archimedes principle, which in this case is related to the, the densities. If the density of the balloon is less than the density of the atmosphere, it will fall upwards. If the density of the balloon is greater than the density of the atmosphere, it will sink downwards. So let's just calculate that out. Density of the balloon is mass over volume of the balloon. The mass of the balloon, there we are, is 80 grams, 0 .8, 0, 0 0.08 kilograms, divided by 0 0.30 meters cubed, which gives me a value of 0 0.267 kilograms per meter to minus 3. The density of the atmosphere We're given in question 0 0.35 kilograms per meter cubed. All right, so what that tells us is the density of the atmosphere is bigger than the density of the balloon, which means the balloon will rise. So the balloon will rise upwards. The explanation is the density of the balloon is less than the density of the atmosphere. There we go. Question four. A 240 volt 60 watt lamp is connected to a 240 volt supply. The lamp has a constant temperature all right, that's quite important. State the rate at which the lamp transfers energy 
to the surroundings. Well, the key point here is it's a constant temperature. So if, ha if it's utilizing 60 watts of energy, then to keep its temperature constant, it must also be transferring 60 watts of energy out to the surroundings. Two, the names of the thermal processes by which the lamp transfers energy to the surroundings. Well, the first one, because it's a lamp, is going to be radiation. It radiates the energy as a light energy. And the other one will be by convection. Because, of course, the lamp is surrounded by air, it forms these convection currents and transfers the heat around that way as well. B. Figure 4.1 shows a thick copper block that's been heated to 400 degrees Celsius. One side of the block is dull black. The other side of the block is polished and shiny. And from the looks of it, there are two thermometers. Thermometer A is on the dull black side, thermometer B on the shiny side and copper in the middle. 1. In experiment 1, the thermometer bulbs are both painted black. They are placed at equal distances from the surface of the block. The maximum temperature shown by each thermometer is recorded. Explain any difference between the maximum temperature shown by the two thermometers. All right, let's look at this picture. So what we have, we have a dull black surface and a shiny black surface. Well, the dull black surface will be much better at radiating energy, which means thermometer is going to be getting a lot more energy on that side a lot more energy incident on it landing on it from the block so we'd expect it to get warmer all right so let's look at this and let's answer the question now I'll do this using the approach i came up with for long answer questions something happens which has an effect which means therefore Okay, so something happens. The block is very hot. No marks for that at all. Which has an effect. The heat radiates from the surface. So heat radiates from the surface. Dull black will emit more radiation than the shiny black surface. So the dull black surface will emit more ra energy as radiation than the shiny black surface will. Therefore, Thermometer A will have a higher temperature than the one on the dull black surface side. There we go. 2. In experiment 2, the thermometer bulbs are both shiny silver coloured. They are placed the same difference from the surfaces of the block as in experiment 1. State and explain any differences that are observed in the maximum temperatures shown by the thermometer in experiments 1 and 2. So I'll just take the same approach as last time. Something happens which has an effect, which means therefore... So, the bulbs of the thermometer are now silver. No marks for that because it's in the question. Which has an effect? Well, silver is better at reflecting radiated heat. Which means the bulbs heat up less. Therefore, the thermometer's reading, readings remain lower. In this case, well, in experiment 2. So, in experiment 2, the thermometer readings will remain lower. C. Figure 4.2 shows a firefighter wearing shiny silver-coloured clothing. Ah, like a 1950s spaceman. State the benefit to a firefighter of wearing shiny silver-coloured clothing. Well, we've already discussed the idea that silver is better at reflecting heat. So if you're a firefighter, you want to keep your firefighter cooler, and this will do the effect. So it keeps a firefighter cooler than dark matte clothing. So it's much safer for them to be wearing that kind of clothing than it is the dark clothing. Question 5. Figure 5.1 shows some gas trapped in a metal cylinder by a piston. Uh, the position of the piston is fixed. The cylinder is moved from a cold room to a warm room. Explain in terms of molecules what happens to the pressure of the gas in the cylinder. Alright, let's briefly talk through this. So what's going to happen? It goes from a cold room to a warm room. Now that means that the kinetic energy of the molecules in the gas will increase. They get more kinetic energy, they move around faster. As they move around faster, see, pressure, when it happens in the walls of the cylinder here, it happens because the molecules of gas are hitting off the metal cylinder and bouncing back. You get this change in momentum because of that. And if those molecules are moving faster, you get a bigger change in momentum. 
a bigger change in momentum will mean a bigger force. Pressure equals force over area, so a bigger force means a bigger pressure. All right, so now we know what's happening. Let's try and put that down into words. And we'll use our standard approach for this type of question. Something happens, which has an effect, which means, therefore. Okay, so something happens. The temperature of the gas increases, which has an effect. Well, the kinetic energy of the gas molecules will increase. And the kinetic energy increases because the speed is increasing. Nothing to do with the mass changing. The mass will remain constant. And this means that it's going to collide with the walls harder and going to get this greater change in momentum. So down to the therefore, well, the, therefore, the walls of the cylinder are going to experience a greater pressure due to the gas molecules, due to the change in momentum of the gas molecules. And there we go. Let's look at part B. Part B, the piston is now released. It moves to the right and finally stops. Explain these observations in terms of the pressure and the volume of the gas in the cylinder. All right, key points it wants us to talk about pressure and volume and explain why the piston moves to the right and stops. That's important. If we're going to start explaining this and we're not using the words or the terms pressure and volume, then we're not going to get the marks. Now, we know from our physics, of course, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. And what we see happening here is, as the piston moves to the right, the volume increases. The volume increases, the pressure decreases in order to remain equal. So, let's write that down. As the volume of the gas increases, the pressure of the gas decreases, as the frequency of, of collisions with the piston decreases. So as the volume of the gas increases, the pressure of the gas decreases, as the frequency of the collisions of gas molecules with the piston decreases. And of course the piston's going to stop moving when the pressure inside the piston equals the pressure outside the piston. There's no resultant force in. And there we go. Question 6. A. A ray of light is incident on a boundary with air. State what happens uh, to the ray when the angle of incidence of the ray is one less than the critical angle of the glass. Now, if it's less than the critical angle of the glass, the ray is going to travel out of the glass um, into the air and it's going to change direction as it does so. Two, if it's greater than the critical angle of the glass, then you're going to get total internal reflection. 100% of the ray is reflected back into the glass, the glass block. There we are. So 100% of the ray is reflected back into the glass block. Total internal reflection. B. Uh, we've got an incident. Oh, we've got a ray coming in. Incident to the block. At A, the critical angle of the glass is 41 degrees. Right. Okay, what does that mean? The critical angle of the block is 41 degrees. Let's just talk about that. When it says 41 degrees, it's talking about this angle from the normal line. So, above 41 degrees, which is probably about there, any angle bigger than that, so any angle from here onwards, will undergo total internal reflection. Less than 41 degrees, it might be able to escape. Well, it would be able to escape. But above 41 degrees, it's not able to escape. And this angle here is 90 degrees minus 30 degrees. It's 60 degrees. So that's much bigger than 41 degrees. So continue the ray from B until it leaves the glass block. What's going to happen? We get total internal reflection there. And as it leaves the glass block, it's going to change direction. There we go. Let's put in a couple of angles, a couple of arrows, sorry. And this angle here will be exactly the same, 30 degrees. There we are. That's it. And it's not completely symmetrical about point B because point B is off center. It's actually off to the right in the block. 
2. Calculate the refractive index of the glass. Okay. The refractive index is just 1 over the sine of C, which is 1 over the sine of 41 degrees, which will give me 1.52. But as we look at it, here we go, two significant figures. Here we should really have two significant figures in the answer, so that's 1.5. And there's no units for the refractive index. There we go, because it's just a ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the block. Now, if you're not sure where this came from, or you want to see where that is, uh, dBn equals 1 over sine c. Let's just quickly show you. n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. Now, n of air is 1. So that gives me sine of theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. All right. Now, what happens when you get total internal reflection is that point where the angle becomes 90 degrees. It's going right along the surface of the block, so sine of 90 degrees is 1. So 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. We'll get this value for the... There we go. We get that value for the refractive index as 1 over sine of theta 2. That's why we get that 1 over sine of 41 degrees. That's where it came from, just in case you don't remember that n equals 1 over sine of c, the, the critical angle. You can work it out quickly as so long as you remember sine of 90 degrees is 1, and it's 90 degrees that you're working with. 7. A loudspeaker produces a sound of constant frequency. That would be so annoying. A. State what is meant by frequency. Okay, frequency is the number of wave fronts passing a fixed point, a stationary point, in one second. There we go. B. The sound wave travels in air towards a barrier with a small air gap at its centre. Big 7.1 represents the, compression of, uh, the compressions of the wave travelling towards the barrier. State what is meant by compression. Well, compression is a region of high pressure. Sound waves are high pressure, low pressure. Bits of compression is where you get high pressure. A region of high pressure. You can just write high pressure. There we go. The width of the gap is smaller than the wavelength lambda of the wave. Draw the pattern of the compressions after the sound wave has passed through the gap. All right. So what's going to happen here? It's going to go through the gap and then it's going to spread out. The most difficult thing here, it's going to spread out in semicircular circular shape. Most difficult thing here oh, will be keeping it the same distance because this lambda here you really want to have the same here same distance you also want the same distance here and whenever you see these uh, things asking you to do this uh, draw the extra waves traveling along always make sure you draw at least three it's always a mark in there for drawing three of them so I'm trying hard here to make sure that I'm keeping up that same Wavelength. There we go. This is probably one of the things I find the most difficult. I mean, look at that, it's not semicircular. Circular. There we go. Beautiful. You know what? Use a pencil. Take an eraser into the exam. There we are, last one. Oh. Circle, circle, circle. Oh, it's getting a bit terrible down the bottom, isn't it? Absolute pain to draw these. What's well, pretty handy, actually, if you can take a compass in to the exam, that make your life much easier. Otherwise, you're going to end up doing what I'm doing, which is spending a while correcting your picture. Doesn't have to be perfect, though. Key point. Doesn't have to be perfect. If it's terrible, make it better. Okay, and for all these ones, the gap between them should be the same. We've still got that same wavelength. Not getting smaller, they're not changing, they get the same distance between them. 
So always, just to be clear, at least three, unless you want to lose marks. The barrier is adjusted so the gap becomes wider. Describe how this affects uh, the pattern of compressions after the sound wave has passed through the gap. Well, if it's wider, what's going to happen is the wave will actually spread out less. There we go. Part C, the frequency of the sound wave is 6,800 hertz. The speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. Calculate the wavelength of the sound in air. Well, for that we need our wave equation, C equals F lambda. And C, F lambda, we're being asked to calculate the wavelength, which is lambda. So we just cover lambda over, and that will leave us with C divided by F. which is 340 meters per second, divided by 6,800 hertz, which gives us 0 0.05 meters. Make sure that decimal point is visible and units, remember the units. Two, state a typical value for the speed of sound in a liquid. All right, about a kilometer a second. That's a typical value for the speed of sound in a liquid. It's say 340 for sound in air. We've got a kilometer a second approximately for sound in a liquid and about five kilometers a second for sound in a solid. Eight, a bar magnet is made of metal. Suggest a, a material from which the bar magnet is made, steel. Steel is pretty much the best one for a bar magnet. Why? Well, because it's cheap, it's plentiful, and it's magnetically hard. Once you magnetize it, it will keep its magnetism. B, figure 8.1, shows the bar magnet being inserted into a coil of wire. The north pole and south pole of the bar magnet are marked. The coil is connected to a galvanometer. All right, so part one, explain why the galvanometer deflects as the bar magnet is being inserted into the coil. Let's take our normal approach. Something happens, which has an effect, which means, therefore, okay, so something happens, the magnet moves towards the coil. So something happens, the magnetic field moves towards the coil, which has an effect. The coil is then going to cut through those lines of magnetic field, lines of magnetic flux around the magnet. So the coil will cut through the magnetic field lines, which means the coil will generate a magnetic field to oppose this motion. Therefore, a current will flow in the coil. That's how it generates the magnetic field. Um, what we'd want to see, we'd want to see, in this case, a voltage is induced, and this creates an induced current. There we go. So the magnet moves towards the coil. The coil will cut through the magnetic field lines uh, about the magnet. The coil will generate a magnetic field to oppose this motion. A voltage will be induced in the coil, creating an induced current. So a key point here is the use of the word induced. That means that it's happening without touching. It's happening because we've got a changing magnetic field next to a conductor. So specifically it means it's happening because it's not touching, you can get induced EMF, you can get induced current, you can get induced uh, charge. So make sure you're using that when you need it. Two, explain what determines the direction of the reading uh, on the galvanometer. All right, well that's actually gonna be determined by whether it's a north or a south pole moving towards the coil, because it will attempt the, the induced voltage, the induced current, will be in such ways to prevent an emotion or to oppose the motion. So let's write that down. So it's going to depend on which pole is entering the coil. So the direction of the induced uh, voltage or induced EMF will oppose the change producing it. C. Describe a method for demagnetizing a bar magnet. Oh, there's a couple for this one. Step number one, hit it with a hammer. <laughs> we 
which actually will work. You know what, I'm going to write that one in. That's one possibility. Hit it with a hammer until it doesn't want to be a magnet anymore. Hit it with a hammer until it's demagnetized. Second possibility, heat it up above its Curie temperature. Third possibility, of course, would just be uh, putting it inside a coil of wire that's carrying an AC voltage and then slowly remove it, as long as it's producing a large AC voltage. All right. As it only asked for one method, you can pick any of those. So I'll just write the last one in. Now we'll put it inside a coil of wire carrying a large AC current or AC voltage uh, and slowly remove to a large distance. Any of those three will do, so I'll just delete the last two. And the reason for the removing the last two is so you can see the answer I've put down. It only asked for one, so that's fine. Nine. Uh, the resistance of a circuit component varies with the brightness of the light falling on the surface. Well, okay, it's a light dependent resistor then. State the name of this component light dependent resistor. Two, draw the circuit symbol for this component. First bit looks like a resistor. There we go. And with light coming in instant on it. There we go, perfect. Light dependent resistor. B. Figure 9.1 shows a 6 volt battery connected in series with a 1.2 kilo ohm resistor and a thermistor. At a certain temperature, the resistance of the thermistor is 2.4 kilo ohms. Calculate the reading on the voltmeter. Okay, so what do we have? Well, the voltage that we're going to get will be equal to 2.4 kilo ohms divided by 1.2 kilo ohms plus. 2.4 kilo ohms multiplied by the supply voltage, which is 6 volts. And that will give us 4 volts. Oops, two significant figures 4.0 volts. There we are. Probably a good idea just to write that down. Voltage across the resistor equals to the value of R1, voltage across R1, R1 plus R2, multiplied by volt Vs. There we are. Now I'm pretty sure I've got all the marks. And it's every possibility I didn't have to write that last bit down to get the marks. I'm just doing it because, you know, make sure. Two, the battery connected to the circuit in figure 9.1 is not charged. It's not much of a battery. Hmm, paperweight. Suggest a change that would cause the reading of the voltmeter. Oh, <laughs> I read that wrong. The battery connected to the circuit in 9.1 is not changed. It's the same battery, not, not charged. That would be terrible. Suggest a change that would cause the reading of the voltmeter to decrease. Okay, well, let's come up here and go back to the picture. So the question is, what will make this voltage decrease? That voltage will decrease if the voltage across here decreases. And that will happen if the resistance decreases. So we're dealing with the thermistor here. As the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. So as it gets warmer, that resistance will decrease and the voltage across it will decrease. Just to clarify, and I'll just use the equation from above, R1 over R1 plus R2 times Vs. If this gets lower, then the value of the voltage across it will get lower. All right, so what that means is we heat it up. Question 10, describe the movement of charge that causes an object to become positively charged by well, that point you've got movement of electrons haven't you a movement of electrons away from the object so the electrons move from the object to another location b figure 10.1 shows a negatively charged rod held over an uncharged metal sphere on figure 10.1 i had to plus in negative signs to represent the results of the movement of charge within the sphere all right what's going to happen is you're going to end up with the positive charges well, the positive charge is moving, that's not what happens at all. What's going to happen? You're going to end up with the negative charges being repelled 
further down the sphere. And that happens because the negative charges are able to move. The positive charges are, of course, fixed at the atomic nuclei. So some electrons move further down, and we end up with a positive charge on the top of the sphere and a negative charge on the bottom of the sphere, all because the negatively charged rod is there. You move that rod, charge goes back to normal, it's neutral all over. Now you will notice when I've drawn this, I've put the same number of positive and negative signs at the top and the bottom. So there we go. Two, describe the actions that must be taken to obtain an even distribution of positive charge on the surface of the sphere. All right, what I would actually want to do, and I'll draw this on here to explain it, is what I would want to do is attach that, there we go, to the earth. If I attach that to the earth, the negative charges, the electrons, don't just have to move to the bottom. They've got this whole way they can travel away. And then you'd end up with a situation where you've just got that positive charge at the top. Then what I would do is remove that section, remove the, the path to Earth, and then remove the negatively charged rod, and it will all just spread out. You'd end up with an overall net positive charge. Let's just fix my picture again so I don't lose any marks. One, two, three, four. There we go. And now what I have to do is explain that. Describe the action that must be taken to obtain an even distribution of positive charge on the surface of the sphere. So, with the rod present, key point, attach the earth. Attach it to the earth or earth the sphere. It's another way to say it. Describe what happens. I'm going to describe what happens. Electron will flow to the earth, leaving the sphere with a positive charge. And then what we do, of course, we want to remove the earth, but we want to keep the rod present while we do that so the electrons don't come back up. That's great, but we haven't finished because all the positive charge is going to be located at the top. So then remove the rod. Remove the rod, and now there should be an even distribution of positive charge on the surface of the sphere. Problem solved. Next one. 11. A radioactive source is tested over a number of hours with a radiation detector. These readings are shown in Table 11.1. .1. Use the readings to suggest a value for the background count rate during the test and to determine the half-life of the sample. All right. Let's look at our readings as we go through it. Big, getting reducing rapidly. And what we see, we get to this section here. Between 4 and 10. And it looks like within experimental error, and uh, being in mind that of course background radiation will be random and unpredictable as well, that seems to be made up mostly of background radiation. So if readings from 4 hours to 10 hours are all background radiation, what we can do to get a good reading for the background radiation, a number we should use, we can calculate the average. Background radiation count, and write down the calculation that you're doing. So there we go, that will give us 19 counts per hour. Okay, so now we still want to find the uh, half-life of the sample. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through reading 0 to 3, and I'm going to subtract 19 from them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to label this the sample count. So what I'm going to do is take the values from the original table and subtract 19, to subtract the background radiation count from them. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a look at the numbers we've got. We've got 305. Let's subject that to one uh, half-life. I'm going to get a number of about 150. If I sub subject it to another half-life, then I'm going to get a value of 76. So I've got two half-lives occurring here, and I've got a value of 76. That's interesting because it's very close to the value of 77. All right, so suppose I then take my value of uh, 76. Multiply that by half, multiply that by half. Then I'm going to get a value of 19, which we can see is very close to the value here. So it seems like every time we go through a time of one hour, that's the same as two half-lives. 
That's what's happening. So I've got two half-lives equal to one hour, which means the half-life is 30 minutes. Let's write down our answers. Background count rate, 19, give or take. So what's happened here? I've made a mistake. Let's look at it. Let's see what that mistake was. I've said my background count rate is 19 counts per hour. Let's look at the table it comes from. What you can see is the reading here is in counts per second. So what we need to do, let's correct that. It's being measured each hour, but the count is per second. So there we go. Always double back, always check those units. You'll find you'll save yourself marks doing that. And look, you can make mistakes. It's absolutely fine. Everyone does it. Just make sure you find those mistakes and get them right. Right, B. Hydrogen 3 tritium has one proton and two neutrons. The nucleon number of tritium is three. It decays by emitting an, a beta particle. Complete the nuclide equation to show this decay. So it's basically just complete the decay equation. The symbol X represents the nuclide produced by this decay. When they say nuclide, all they actually mean is the nucleus. It's just like um, nuclide could be any nucleus. That's literally it. it so happens to be labelled in this way, it fixes its value. All right, so here we go. We start with hydrogen, and the numbers we're going to want here are 3 and 1. The bottom is the charge, also called a proton number. So it's a charge or proton number. And we can see that's given to us here. One proton, two neutrons, one positive charge, and three things that are jammed into the nucleus, three nucleons. That's what that number up there is. Okay, so let's look at the beta particle. A beta particle is an electron. Very little mass, so up here is zero. It's not in the nucleus. So it's got no mass, not in the nucleus. Zero up there. It's a charge of negative one. And finally, we have our symbol X here. Well, let's talk a bit about this. These numbers, this number plus this number, this number plus this one along the top, have to be equal to this last number. So 3 plus 0 has to give me a value of 3. 1 plus negative 1 has to give me a value of 2. And there we are. That's the end result. Because all these numbers at the top should balance. Also, you know, 0 plus 3 will give me 3. Minus 1 plus 2 will give me 1. So there we go. The charge and the mass numbers are conserved. C. The arrows in figure 11.1 show the paths of three alpha particles moving towards gold nuclei in a thin foil. Uh, complete the paths of the three alpha particles. All right. First of all, alpha particles have got a nice positive charge. And the nucleus has a positive charge as well, so they're going to get knocked back as they get too close. This one's going to come back here. You know what? This is a nice, easy question. It's worth three marks. This is the reason why you should go through the test at the beginning and do the easy questions first. If you go through it one at a time, you're trying to get all those marks as you run through it, you might never get to this question. It only takes a few seconds. Here we go. We've got a gold nucleus. We're going to see a big deflection because it's getting pretty close there. Come down there. That's it. A little bit difficult to do this on a computer tablet, so here we go. hopefully that's fine. And the last one, we're going to see another deflection. It's going to be a very small deflection. It'll be a slight deflection because it's more to one side than the other. It's not going through the center. So there we go, very slight deflection. Off like that. There we go, three marks for 30 seconds work. Not bad. Okay, excellent. Well, if you like that video, feel free to like and subscribe. I'm going to try and release uh, hopefully five videos a, a week, maybe a few more. We're aiming for five in the hopes of helping you out as you run up to your exams. So have a great day and I hope you've enjoyed it.